Rub up your engines! Well, here's a warning saying that the U.S. is spoiled by cheap Canadian oil, and it's going to change. The Canadians, it turns out, for a long time, have been spending billions making a pipeline so that they can sell their oil to people besides us, making a Trans Mountain pipeline so then they can start shipping that stuff out to Asia, right? And now the big market there, the Chinese will buy all the oil they can get their hands on. And now the Canadian government spent an awful lot of money on this. They lost. It was private originally, and the Canadian government bought out. But they say that they're going to get it done. It's called the Trans Mountain. Mountain oil pipeline. You can do all the research you want, you'll see. They've been working on it for years. The Canadian federal government bought what they had built for four billion. It's been in red tape bureaucracy, which the Canadian government is full of. It turns out that the government of the province it's going through was dead set against it. They were all greenies. They didn't want a pipeline going through their area. Now money trumps all, so they're gonna be building the thing. And if they get more bids from China and places that they can now ship them from ships on the Canadian West Coast out to Asia, then they're not going to be giving the discounts to Americans that they are, because we're here, and we already got pipelines coming from Canada, and it's all set up. We'll see what happens with this pipeline. It's not done yet. They're still working on it, but it does have a big thing to make gasoline more expensive in the United States, because we're getting a better deal from the Canadians, and if they can sell it overseas and get more money, then of course they'll raise the price here too. Well, the electric car manufacturing world is starting to crumble. Volvo cut off the funding for their EV affiliate pole star. They're finding that golly gee, people don't want to buy these things, right? Originally, Volvo funded a ton of Polestar electric car, and the Volvo car is pretty much a Polestar car. Now, Volvo's saying bye-bye Polestar. All these companies, you're going to watch them fall like dominoes. If you don't know what dominoes are, the square things with dots on them, you line them up, push them, and they go down the line. Volvo actually makes a decent electric car. It's weird. I checked one out last year. A guy brought me one. And I said in the video, if this was an electric car, I'd think about getting one because I really like the way it rode. But still, it's an electric car. You got to charge it up and all that, blah, 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 blah. Plus, the thing started at 65000 bucks a pop, right? Well, even Volvo now has given up with Polestar and said goodbye because they're realizing the handwriting on the wall. They're not selling too many of these things. People are not going to want to buy these things. You would think these companies would look at their own market. Who buys their cars? Okay, soccer moms buy Volvos. They can go wherever they want, take their kids, drive everywhere, not have to worry about them. Knowing that they're safe cars, they can drive all over the place. Not thinking, oh gee, it's running out of electricity. What am I going to do? Where am I going to plug it in, right? That's not the type of person that buys a Volvo. Volvo, I guess, finally realized, gee, maybe this electric car deal wasn't such a smart idea. Goodbye, Polestar. We don't have anything to do with it anymore. This is just the tip of the iceberg as far as I'm concerned. You're going to find a bunch of these electric car companies going to go down the toilet, especially if they're selling a lot of cars in the United States. And they got a niche market in Europe, different places, you know, that they'll probably be able to get away with it. And they'll probably make micro ones for Asia because they got really small cars. They got a lot of those K cars in Asia, right? They're tiny. It would be nothing to electrify those things. They don't go all that far. You know, take a country like Singapore. It's tiny. A lot of people on that tiny island, but it's tiny. They don't drive all that far. Electric cars for them would be perfectly fine. Little tiny baby ones, right? But Volvo's finding it out. Ah, gee, you know, our market, uh, they don't really want to buy these electric cars. Goodbye, Polestar. All right, I can't help but just laugh at all these people with their, everyone's going to drive battery electric cars, right? Listen to the title of the article by one of these pro-battery car people. A tale of two Toyotas doing more to electrify America than anyone while slowing electrification down. They're slowing down electrification, right? Because these people have the strange belief that battery electric cars are what we have to do no matter what. Come hell or high water, we're going to use battery electric cars. Doesn't matter if people hate them, they fall apart, they cost a fortune to fix when they break. The insurance rates go sky high on them because the insurance companies find out they get minor wrecks with batteries damaged. Okay, there's 20 grand for a Tesla battery, so they got to pay for that, so the rates will be going up. Hardly anybody knows how to fix them. No, they want to push that forward, right? Well, the guy wrote this article. He's saying, oh, well, it was great in the beginning. Toyota made the Prius hybrid. Oh, oh, and they were green. You know, everybody always made the jokes about the people in their Priuses being snobs about, oh, well, hi, my car doesn't pollute. These people are still shaming Toyota because Toyota said, well, maybe 30% will be a battery electric cars. Maybe. We don't know. Where all these idiots like GM and Ford were saying, we'll be 100% electric by 2035. Well, they're all backpedaling on that when they find out people aren't buying the cars, right? So I can't stand it that these people 
people are believing this. It's now a belief system, battery electric cars. They're going to shove it down everyone's throat, whether they want it or not. They don't fit American ideal of easy, cheap transportation. It's dependable. You don't have range anxiety. There's gas stations all over the place to put gas in your car, right? I wish they'd just shut up and close the door. Maybe they can go in their own chat rooms or something, talk to each other, because I'm tired of them trying to push their agenda on people who don't want their battery electric cars. Well, I'm laughing at the Cybertruck. The Tesla Cybertruck, did they even test these things out before they sold them? Get this, they have fancy wheel covers to get better electrical range, right? Well, it turns out that the Tesla Cybertruck wheel, the covers cause unusual wear and they rub on the tires. I'm telling you, this whole thing is one cockamamie idea, half thought out and then sold to people. And they're going for like a hundred grand plus now. Originally, they had these covers, they're more aerodynamic, but it turns out the things were flying off. <laughs> They did actually test that part and they flew off. So what did they do? They made them so they fit closer on the tire, right? But the problem is now they're so tight, they rub holes in the tires, they wear the tires out. So they're telling people, well, don't have those covers on now. We're going to have to do something else. Did anybody even think this thing through with the Cybertruck? I mean, it's hilarious. Well, you know, the wheel covers kept flying off. Okay, let's put them closer to the wheel. Gee, maybe that'll rub on the tire. Now, who would even think about that? You think the engineer would say, look, Jack, now the wheel cover is touching the tire and we are driving around it's going to rub holes in the tire right this is how poorly thought out these cyber trucks were you know it's like a homer simpson dream car and then they just built it without any idea of engineering and what could possibly happen and now the hubcaps that they put on are wearing holes in the tires i mean you can't make this stuff up <laughs> tight hater says what are your thoughts on the first generation CRV? I live in Alberta a few months ago. I got a 97 CRV with 496,000 kilometers. Right now it has 515,000 kilometers. I got it for 1400 bucks. I love it. What do you think of these? How should I maintain it? Those were phenomenal cars. Back in 97, those things could run forever. Actually, Honda's been going downhill a little bit in the past few years. And back in 97, they were running high with pretty much Honda and Toyota were neck and neck for best cars in the world. Change your oil and filter every 5,000 miles to full synthetic. Change the coolant every three years. Flush the brake fluid out every four or five years. Change the transmission fluid, I'd say, if it's an automatic, every uh, 40,000 miles or so, just a little plug. You take it out, it empties, and then you pump it back up. It's easy to do, right? Those were such well-built vehicles. Well, look, you got 515,000 kilometers on it. You only paid 1,400 bucks, and it still runs fine. They don't make them like they used to. That was one of the best cars they ever made in real world. The new ones are still decent, but CVT transmission, yours has a real transmission with real gears in it. They just made them better back in the day. Bob the Hat King says, is there any reason for my sister not to get a Kia electric vehicle? She had a Nissan Leaf, it got totaled. So she's looking at a Nissan Leaf, a Hyundai, or a Kia EV. What do you think? Well, I'm not an electric car fan, but I mean, she's in California. She had a Nissan Leaf. She liked it. She gets free charging at work. Just have her get another Leaf if she liked it, right? To begin with, if you're going to get that Kia EV, you know, those things start at $60,000 and they are Kia. I would not buy a Korean car. I just don't care. I work on cars for a living. I see the Kias breaking all the time. They're expensive to fix. And in that case, the EV, it's a very expensive car. She's going to get a Nissan Leaf for a lot less. And since she liked her old one, it just got wrecked and smacked up. Have her go ahead and get another one. If she doesn't mind that small range, she obviously can charge it free at work. And if she doesn't live that far and she likes driving it, she doesn't do cross country trips in her Nissan, go right ahead. You know. I actually have customers that have tiny little cars. Some are electric, some aren't. And then when they want to take a long road trip, they go to Hertz, Alamo, whatever, and they rent a car for their trip because you don't pay for mileage anymore when you rent a car. And they just rent a big car when they take a trip and then they come back and drive their little car when they're home. I'd say Nissan Leaf. Do not buy an electric Kia. The NX78 says, what type of fuel can my Mazda CX-5 use? It requires premium fuel, but it costs twice as much. Can I use Octane Booster? What should I do? All right. No, don't do anything. Use regular gasoline. Here is information from Mazda itself. And here's what it says. The Mazda CX-5 can use 87 octane gasoline without premium fuel. The Skyactiv 
G 2.5 turbo four cylinder engine will benefit with extra horsepower using 93 octane premium. To start off with your question, you're wasting your money using octane booster. It's so expensive. If you want to bump 87 to 93, you got to make it go up six points. And it will cost you more money in octane booster than it will buy in the gas that already is the higher octane at the pump. As all modern cars are, if you have that fancy one, says, oh, it'll work better with premium fuel. You just lose a few horsepower. You probably wouldn't even notice the difference. The modern cars have such technology in them, they can compensate for whatever the octane is and they'll run perfectly fine. The computer can set the fuel injection, the ignition timing to make it run perfectly fine on regular octane gasoline. That's the truth. Don't be listening to people trying to sell you a bunch of crap that you don't need. It's like the same thing with the Mustang EcoBoost that has the four cylinder EcoBoost engine in it, right? And it'll have like 330 horsepower or something with premium, and it'll have like 295 or something with regular gas. It's still an awful lot of horsepower. You probably won't notice the difference. Won't hurt the vehicle. It'll run perfectly fine, and so will your Mazda. So if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.